Um, so welcome everyone on behalf of Niagara Connect. We've got with us uh, Lori Klein-Smith, a uh, health promoter for Bridges Community Health Centre, and Damon Starr, owner of Damon Starr Commercial Enterprises, to talk to us today about better business outcomes through a more secure workforce. So they're here um, based on a project, Poverty and Employment Precarity in Niagara, or PEPIN. So this being a collaborative initiative of the United Way, Niagara Falls and Greater Fort Erie, um, Brock University Social Justice Research Institute, and it's funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So the goal of PEPIN is to understand the state of precarious employment and the impact it has on Niagara residents and to develop best practices so that policymakers service providers, advocacy coalitions, and employers can learn how to mitigate risks associated with precarious employment. And of course, the premise being that this project is a step towards ensuring jobs are a pathway to income and employment security. So I'm not sure if folks saw um, the most recent uh, labor force survey published by Seth Can, but they demonstrated that in the past 20 years, the number of temp workers jumped by 50%, rising faster than the number of permanent jobs up 33%. So we know this topic to be, of course, very timely and salient and are happy um, on behalf of Niagara Connects to uh, bring together today Lori and Damon to share about their project. We're going to listen for the first 40-45 um, minutes to the presenters and then we're going to have a facilitated question and answer period. If you see in the bottom left of your screen the chat pod, at any point in time you can type your questions into the chat pod. We will um, answer them, though, in the last 15-20 uh, minutes of the session together. I will read them aloud and we'll go through them with the presenters. And if you want to come off mute at that time, you can press star six, which I will remind folks when we get to that point in time, if you'd like to ask anything supplementary to what was typed in the chat pod um, and engage with the presenters. So um, over to you, Lori and Damon. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to move through the slide here. Um, trying to get the agenda up. It's not coming up. There it is. Okay. So thanks and welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, so through my work at uh, Bridges Community Health Centre, I became um, uh, connected with the uh, the Pepin Research Project team. I'm a member of the um, of the steering committee for this project, and it is through this project that we were able to um, secure funding and support uh, to produce this webinar. So we're uh, very excited to um, be here today to present this information to you and to share um, and to include Damon, I should say, in uh, in this. And he will have a very interesting um, uh, presentation after mine. Um, so I hope that, uh, that you enjoy the webinar and that you um, learn a few things. So I'm just going to quickly go over the agenda. Um, first, we will be looking at uh, the benefits of a more secure workforce and we'll gain a better understanding of precarious employment and its impacts. Next, we will look at five key practices uh, to increase workforce security for better business outcomes. We will also highlight and review four useful resources to help businesses enhance or improve workforce security. Then we will hear from Damon Starr how he adapted his business model to increase workforce security and productivity. And we will conclude with a question and answer period. Okay. So there are many benefits to building a more secure workforce. Building a secure workforce can lead to increased employee engagement and satisfaction, and as a result, employees tend to be more aligned with an organization's mission and purpose. This in turn can lead to increased productivity and profitability, reduced turnover and associated costs, reduced absenteeism, and an enhanced reputation as both a good place to work and to do business. Many employers who have taken steps to increase workforce security have found that these benefits have transformed the way they do business. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, we will be hearing from Damon later, and he will be providing a firsthand experience on um, some of the changes he made in his own workforce um, and the benefits that both he and employees, he and his employees have experienced. 
So addressing workforce security is a very timely issue. Um, we know that attracting and retaining talent has been a growing priority for many Ontario businesses for some time now with a recent survey finding that 86% experienced difficulty hiring in the preceding six months. With the record low unemployment rates across Ontario over the past while, this seems to be a likely trend to, be, to continue, and the competition for motivated and competent workers is most definitely heating up. However, many businesses and industries remain tied to business models which are reliant on practices that foster employment precarity. This can have a direct impact on their ability to successfully recruit and retain employees and can affect prof uh, productivity, profitability, and sustainability. We will take a look at employment precarity and its impacts over the next few slides. One competitive strategy that some employers have embarked on is to alter their employment practices by offering workers more stable working conditions to improve workforce security. So let's take a moment just to look at the definition of precarious employment as well as its impacts. Insecure or precarious employment, PE, uh, describes states of employment that do not have the security or benefits generally found in more traditional or standard employment relationships. Elements of precarious employment or characteristics can include um, the actual job classification, such as part-time, temporary, contract, gig, or seasonal, lack of benefits, such as dental, vision, and prescription drugs, scheduling fluctuations, and variability or fluctuations in earnings week to week or month to month. I will also note that Canada has yet to adopt a uh, more common or formal definition of uh, measuring employment precarity, and though, though there is a federal working committee that has been recently established to do so. So I think this will um, probably do a lot to raise the profile of precarious employment in, uh, in Canada. So in 2018, the Pepin um, project, the Poverty and Employment Precarity in Niagara project, showed that um, the results showed that roughly half of Niagara region's employed population between the ages of 25 to 64 were in a standard employment relationship, while about half were not. And this finding is very comparable to research that was done a few years earlier in the Hamilton and uh, Greater Toronto area. Um, through work done by um, another employment precarity project called PEPSO, um, the Poverty and Employment Precarity in Southern Ontario project that was led through McMaster University. And you'll note in the, um, in the slides that we've included uh, links to um, um, both of these. Um, oh, sorry, I'm just jumping ahead here a little too quickly. Um, links to both of these um, projects uh, are there. So you can go in and have a look at these reports and um, see some more of the different findings that were, um, that were found in um, both in the, the Niagara reports as well as in the Southern Ontario reports. Okay. So precarious employment, um, let's look at some ways that it can impact businesses. So employers who engage in business models with a high percentage of precarious employment may find that they have higher turnover, difficulty in recruiting and retaining quality employees, higher absenteeism, uh, disengagement or lower job satisfaction, and lower productivity and higher job errors. And all of these come at a cost to the employer. Employment precarity can also have many impacts on workers or employees. Employees who are precarious employ precariously employed may experience challenges in a number of areas, uh, such as meeting cost of living requirements, such as housing, transportation, childcare, food and clothing. Challenges with uh, both physical and mental health, which can be exacerbated by stress, worry, poor eating and poor sleep. Meeting family, social, and community commitments due to unpredictable work schedules or having to work multiple part-time jobs. 
the ability to even form and maintain relationships can also be a challenge. And career advancement. If professional development and workplace training opportunities are not provided, or if a person does not have enough time or money to take additional courses or training on their own. An increasing number of employers are choosing to grow successful businesses based on a foundation of more stable employment relationships, healthy working conditions, and high employee engagement and satisfaction. Many businesses are being very uh, much more intentional about creating security within their workforce through a variety of practices. Our next few slides will look at a number of these. So we're going to highlight uh, five key practices that um, employers can use to create a more secure workforce and build better business outcomes. And these primarily come through operational changes and investments in employees. And the five areas are compensation, benefits, scheduling, training and professional development, and inclusion. So the first practice, uh, the first key practice is compensation, um, otherwise known as, as wages, I would say. Some considerations uh, regarding compensation include that um, competitive compensation can attract better, better workers and reduce turnover, particularly in a tight labor market. And it's also very useful to understand the cost of living um, for your community to assist in determining base wages. So you'll notice again at the bottom of this slide we've included um, some links to Niagara Region's cost of living and living wage calculations and reports that were done uh, by the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network, um, as well as um, a link to the Ontario Living Wage Network, which has uh, similar calculations and reports done in various municipalities and regions across Ontario. And these can be, uh, I think, a useful, useful tools for um, employers to gain a better understanding of what, um, what it actually costs uh, to live and uh, um, work and be, in, be involved in and included in a community. Um, that's the purpose behind these reports. We do know that while competitive wages alone um, are not the only factor that um, increase employee recruitment and retention, and job satisfaction, um, it's definitely an important foundation on which to build a more secure workforce. So let's look at a few other practices. So providing employees with various benefits that are above the minimum requirements established in the Provincial Employee Employment Standards Act um, is another key practice. So these benefits can include um, providing um, a health benefit package that covers items such as dental, vision, and prescription drugs, uh, disability and life insurance, enhanced policies regarding paid sick and or personal days, flex time, or alternative work options, and even RSPs or other retirement contributions. We do know that you know, many small businesses may may find it challenging to be able to um, provide some of these, um, these benefits. Um, but there's, there are definitely options out there um, that they can look into, uh, joining a larger group health benefits plan, like a pooled plan through an insurance company, um, even inquiring with their local chamber of commerce if they have um, uh, packages or, or plans that they can join into uh, to make it more, um, more affordable and manageable. Another key practice is scheduling. So including employees up front in making scheduling decisions is a useful and important practice. Some may prefer a more uh, flexible schedule, while others may be looking for more stability, predictability, and consistency. Providing advance notice of scheduling and guaranteed minimum hours are also important considerations. Training in professional development is another key practice. We know that regular and ongoing training or professional development opportunities can offer staff access to cross-training to broaden their skill sets and can help prepare them for both um, internal or external career pathways. 
and staff who are cross-trained with a broader set of skills can ensure more stability and productivity for a business. And the last key practice uh, I will highlight is inclusion. And some considerations in the area of inclusion are ensuring that all staff, regardless of their job classification, are engaged and included in all work-related activities, such as communication and social events, both as participants and leaders. This can help to create a culture of equality, participation, and inclusion. Another consideration is asking for and valuing contributions of all employees and ensuring opportunities for staff voice in all areas of the workplace. You must be genuine and intentional in this process. It's not something that can be done just once in a while or as a one-off. It has to be seen as, as an ongoing, um, ongoing process within a workplace. Now, these nothing I've I've said how probably is you know sounding completely off base or um, out of line with what people might think. However, there are um, many businesses that struggle to perhaps find um, ways to adjust business models or to um, to they want to have the intention of wanting to work towards some of these, but they they have difficulty doing that. So. Um, I'm going to provide, I'd like to provide some resources that employers may find useful when looking to enhance or change business practices to increase their workforce security. We know that many employers would prefer to offer more stable jobs and working conditions, um, but might find it difficult to, to define what this looks like and to embark on making some of these changes. So I'm going to provide just a brief overview of each of these resources, and I encourage you to take some time um, afterwards to visit each website and explore the content and the tools that are included um, much, uh, much further and in depth. So the first, um, first resource that I'd like to highlight is the Better Business Outcomes Through Workforce Security Toolkit. And this was actually developed by KPMG and United Way Toronto and York Region, and it provides employers with tools to assess their current practices, how ways to adjust these practices, and to improve the well-being of their non-standard workforce while improving business, their business results. And you'll see the uh, website to this is uh, included below. The toolkit's goal is to give employers straightforward incremental practice and policy actions that they can take to help make their workforce more secure and ultimately strengthen their business. And there are three components of the toolkit, uh, which include a business case framework that shows how improving workforce security benefits business outcomes, a number of successful case studies from a diverse group of employers, and an assessment tool that employers can use to identify practical steps that they can take for their own workforce. Another set of uh, useful set of resources was developed by the Ontario Nonprofit Network through their Decent Work project. So they've created a Decent Work charter and toolkit that is meant to guide organizations in identifying areas where decent work practices are being achieved and areas where they would like to improve. I'd like to note that these practices are definitely not exclusive to nonprofit employers. They can be um, useful, considered and useful for employers in any sector. And you can check out their project um, through the link included on this slide. The Better Way Alliance has brought together business owners from across Ontario who share their experiences and champion decent work for the bottom line of their organizations and the health of our economy. Their website, on this, included on the slide, um, contains some great videos and testimonials from members of the Better Way Alliance, as well as a useful section on decent work practices. They are also very active on social media. And I, uh, I do know that Damon is uh, an active member of the Better Way Alliance, so he can um, tell us a little bit more about that as he moves into his slides. And the last resource I will share is uh, one based from the United States um, called the Good Jobs Institute. And they offer um, online assessment tools 
um, and resources, including a good jobs scoreboard, as well as several useful case studies for employers who want to learn ways to develop their own good job strategies through operational changes and investments in their employees. So in summary, um, as was outlined at the beginning of this presentation, there are many benefits to building a more secure workforce. Building a secure workforce can lead to increased employee engagement and satisfaction, and as a result, employees tend to be more aligned with an organization's mission and purpose, which can lead to increased productivity and profitability, reduced turnover and associated costs, reduced absenteeism, and an enhanced reputation as both a good place to work and to do business. And now we will hear from Damon Starr, owner of Damon Starr Commercial Enterprises in Lincoln, who will share his own experiences in creating a more stable workforce and the benefits both he and his employees have experienced. So I'm going to turn it over to Damon now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, Thank you very much for uh, um, listening in, and I, and I hope um, what I share um, will uh, um, potentially uh, at least enlighten um, for those that, that may be uh, interested in uh, looking at their business a little bit differently um, than maybe they do today or validating some things that they're moving towards. So um, <clears throat> the reason that, I, uh, that this came up um, was because uh, although I've run my business for quite a quite a long time since 1992, and um, uh, it, it's got it's morphed uh, over the years into you know a, a, a adapting into different uh, uh, product lines and and that sort of uh, thing. We are in the manufacturing industry here in Ontario, and in the early 90s, manufacturing was was still quite strong. In Ontario, and as we moved towards the late 90s, manufacturing became a little more challenging. And then, when you add things like the economic recession uh, of the early 90s, and then into the early 2000s, um, and then ultimately um, the recession of uh, 2008, 2009, operating as a manufacturer in the province of Ontario became uh, much more challenging because we had uh, global forces kind of impacting how we operated as businesses. And what I found as a result of that and what motivated me um, to look at my business differently in the late 2000s um, was that I was competing against massive corporations in other countries um, for, for work that I would have traditionally had done um, locally, uh, like uh, here in Ontario and then shipped out of Ontario. Uh, we were we were competing now against global markets, so I had to look at uh, our company differently. Uh, so uh, the question I ask myself is, is 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 basically change too tough to do, and I I did find it to be tough to uh, make the decision um, to to look at my business differently. Um, but once I began to implement the changes, I actually began to see uh, operational improvements efficiencies, um, co uh, 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 cost uh, decreases, in fact, um, and uh, how I created relationships with my employees. So we'll move on. So um, the first question we asked ourselves is, is, is change or improvement necessary? And as a business owner, I knew in 2008, 2009, um, that I needed to look at my business differently because uh, we were in the middle of a recession and if I wanted to stay in business once the recession had, had subsided, um, then I needed to uh, look at my business differently because as it was set up, um, it would not have survived um, the recession uh, because we were bleeding cash uh, in our business uh, each and every month. Uh, so. And that's uh, as a result of having high volume, low, uh, low, uh, co low price um, competition. So it meant we had to produce a lot of work at low prices in order to compete with the global market. So the questions we asked ourselves then is, is we, uh, you know, did we, did we 
want to make a change? The question was yes, or the answer was yes. And then uh, we did an authentic assessment. We identified what was going right and what was going wrong. Uh, giving equal attention to both, it was very important that we, we kept our motivation up because if we only dealt with the things that were wrong, then of course we would not improve morale. Um, we knew what we were up against. And so we had to keep, um, uh, keep morale up even though uh, layoffs were happening during that period in time. So we're talking the period 2008 to 2010. Um, to get the uh, perspectives of uh, your employees by talking with them and working alongside them. And that was something I hadn't done prior. I got into a mode where my business seemed like it was moving along. I was, it was a top-down approach. And, um, you know, although I would distribute information throughout the company, I never really, um, you know, through, through um, shop managers, through shop managers, they would, they would delegate to the employees directly, and I had really little connection with my employees. And then I had to ask myself about my business and what are the values, my personal values, that were actually present in the business. And by 2009... Um, I knew that my business did not reflect my values. It, it began to operate in a, in a, in a, uh, a do or die kind of methodology, and it was really cash-based. So, so that was something that was really important to me, that I, I, the business that I was operating actually reflected my values. Um, <clears throat> so the, the model that we had prior as a pro probably mentioned as we talked through the first few slides there, is, is that we had a heavy reliance on outsourcing and temporary staffing. And we moved in that direction in order to relieve us of some of the responsibilities of, uh, of hiring people uh, for long term. And um, we got into uh, um, temporary staffing and, and working with agencies to supply staffing, and it really allowed me to have a more hands-off approach when it came to uh, dealing with employees. Um, again, in retrospect, that wasn't the kind of values I wanted in my business, and it wasn't how I previously operated, um, but it was what we turned into. Um, we had a, a terribly incoherent compensation structure. Um, majority of the employees earned just above minimum wage at the time, and so we're talking 2009-ish, um, and uh, most had secondary jobs to pay basic skills. So what happens during a recession is, is that the, the market, um, uh, you know, there isn't much work going around, so employees look for different work in different places, um, and nobody wants to guarantee anybody, you know, uh, long-term work. And so everybody's just kind of uh, surviving. And that was uh, uh, myself included in that. Uh, the general, general free, uh, feeling in our business was uh, underappreciation, lack of motivation, and fatigue. And our turnover rate uh, that particular year was uh, 75%. And that lasted until about 2012 when we actually implemented our changes. And so we did that over a two-year period. So it, it progressively got better, but, but, I mean, it did take us some time to implement everything we wanted to do. Um, at the time, we had a significantly high uh, error margin and um, also low profitability. So we were operating in late 2009 at a profitability rate of about 3%, um, and uh, uh, losses during the recession, so when we, when we looked at 2009 to 2010, um, we actually had a significant amount of losses, so we didn't even have a 3% profit margin during that particular year. So up to 2009, we were operating at about 3% profit margin, which is, uh, which is pretty low. And so um, we had to ask ourselves what we needed to do, and so we needed to look, and surprisingly enough, we first looked at our client base and, and reviewed our products and services. And the reason for that is, is because we knew we didn't have enough revenue coming in. Um, and uh, we obviously got into a mode of um, 
buying for work and discounting our work in order to win contracts. Um, that became extremely difficult for us um, because, in fact, we were losing our profit margin um, before we even uh, started the work and then tried to, you know, uh, do things and then, uh, find efficiencies within our business and our, our product uh, production area in order to offset uh, those discounts. So we had to consult with our staff to find those efficiencies and achieve our business goals and our objectives. So again, how do we put this right? Um, reduce the reliance on outsourcing. Um, as we move through this, we, we knew that the disconnect between our staff and our management um, was, was causing us uh, some, some uh, uh, trials and tribulations. Um, evaluate our internal compensation and expectations for employment, uh, and we needed to reduce the, that turnover rate that we had within our own staff. Uh, we needed to reduce errors and improve our profitability. So that's what we, that was our goals. And what we, what we did and, and how did we do? Um, as a result of that two-year period, we stabilized our customer base um, and our sales. So we tried to find uh, what was our comfort zone as far as the sales that we, we did. We didn't just, uh, we didn't just go uh, approach every job that possibly we could get um, just, to, just to have lots of volume. What we did is we evaluated or evaluated our contract opportunities to see which ones would be the most um, uh, compatible with our business and our staff uh, their expertise and um, and how that uh, translated into um, profitability and work hours moving forward. So uh, that was very important to us rather than just having lots and lots of volume and taking whatever contracts were coming our way. Uh, we did constant consultation with our staff to maintain our business goals and our objectives and the improvements that we had worked hard to do. And so we're talking into the uh, 2012 year. We reduced outsourcing and we eliminated temporary staffing. We no longer uh, use temporary staffing. I, you know, again, it's not, it's not whether we believe um, a company uh, is providing good or not good service. Um, it was strictly that it did not work for our business model and, um, and, and it didn't meet my values as a business owner. I wanted uh, a better relationship with the people I employed. Um, as a result of that, I, I worked towards, so we did this initially um, in 2012. We, we did some research in our local area, which is Lincoln and the Niagara area, to come up with what we thought was a living wage. And we did that working with our employees and with the community around us. Um, and then we implemented a policy that said we would not hire people less than that particular living wage at the time. Since then, we've uh, aligned ourselves with uh, the Ontario Living Wage Network, a great group of individuals there at the Ontario Living Wage Network that help us through um, this process annually. And, um, and uh, as a result, um, we also uh, connect with other businesses that share the same values as I do, and that is one where um, their employees, uh, you know, uh, have um, uh, a more one-on-one -on -one relationship with the management teams and the, uh, um, the employer themselves. And, and that's very important too, because again, it helps to validate our reasoning for ensuring that, that our staff go home uh, knowing that they can pay their bills. Um, we reduced turnover from 75% in 2009 and, and prior to that, um, to 10%. So that 10% actually was, was somewhat of a, a nutrition situation. And so, uh, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I can, I can say uh, carefully, most, uh, the average uh, year of my staff um, is uh, now 10 years. So uh, nobody has, uh, they, we have new staff through attrition, but the average uh, length of employment with me is, is about 10 years. So that means that they've been with me from 2008 onward. And so we, re we reduced hours, uh, errors, sorry, 
and improve profitability. We now operate uh, above the 10% mark um, in our business, and we try to stay that, keep that stable. Um, and of course, it's always great to make a lot of profit, um, but again, uh, we try to look at our work accordingly and be competitive with, with the market around us. Uh, we create, created stability in our working hours that prior to that, it was very, very um, inconsistent. Uh, people would sometimes work less than 40 hours. Sometimes they work more than 40 hours, and it was all dependent on the customers and not really on our operations. That's prior. But now we have uh, good relationships with our, our customers, and we are able to uh, pass that on to our employees by creating more stable work hours. And um, we also introduced um, some flexibility in that um, so that our, our operation times are efficient. We also get the most out of our employees when they're comfortable in the working hours that they've, they've chosen. So after a year of employment with us, we, um, we allow people to be a little bit more flexible with their, with their hours. Uh, we review employee compensations annually, and we do that faithfully. Um, trust between the employer and the employees is extremely important, um, and so we are very rigid about um, our reviewing our employee compensations. And again, um, for base wages, we work with the Ontario Living Wage Network, and that's a great reminder for us to, uh, um, to work with them in knowing changes that are happening in and around our communities. Uh, one important thing to note is, is that we did not directly increase for, for customers that stayed with us through this time. Um, we did not find that we had to pass that on. So when we increased wages and when we, when we, um, uh, when we uh, uh, introduced benefits, um, we were able to find significant efficiencies. And so an example of that was is when I train in employee turnover, when I train somebody to come into my business, um, the cost there at that time was approximately $8,000 per person. So once they completed from the time they got hired to the time that they could kind of be left to their own devices within the business, um, we estimate that cost at being about $8,000 per person with all of the requirements that we have within our manufacturing company. And when you multiply that by, say, 15 people, there's a significant cost. So if I turned over 15 people in, a, in an annual basis, I'm spending approximately $130,000 a year on training uh, new hires. When I keep employees long-term, I virtually eliminate those costs and everything becomes our annual, you know, um, uh, reviews and, 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 and any new benefit type training that we would provide to our employees for uh, increased uh, um, opportunity within the business or, or educational opportunities moving forward. Those are decisions that we make one-on-one -on -one with the employees. So, um, so that, you know, those are significant costs that can be saved when you don't have employees coming through your business uh, through a, a, a rotating door. So this is kind of my summary here, and, the, and that is, is that, you know, when you're working towards decent work, as a business owner, it's really important to know your business. Um, you do that by being authentic about your business. Um, it's great to have uh, media um, packages and it's, it's great to have promotional material and, and everything like that, but the closer it aligns with what really is happening in your business, the better it is. I know it's really important for business owners to, you know, to make that great impression, but the more authentic that impression is, the better it is for your employees because they are really your best advertisement. Um, so prior to uh, the recession, probably very few of my employees ever really touted our business. And, you know, now I can say that they go home proudly, uh, you know, and they're happy to wear our logo um, when they're out and, and that sort of thing. And so I, I have to say they're probably my best um, customer service. So they, when they deal with our customers, they're, they're the best. And, um, uh, I'd have to say in public, they're, they're also the best and represent us well. So 
I think within the business it's important to welcome uh, opinion, but avoid conjecture because conjecture is just a comparison with what you think the world around you is doing. Um, knowing your operation is probably always the best. Um, this, one, this one really hits home for me as a business owner, and that is, is don't be afraid to raise your expectations. Uh, know your values uh, and consult your staff. And so whenever I say that, sometimes people maybe consider that, you know, I did all this to make more money. I actually did this because I, uh, you know, I get a little emotional, but uh, I actually got to a point where I didn't even want to go to work. So as a business owner, I didn't even like the business I work, like, that I owned and I worked with because I didn't like what was happening. And that was really my motivation. All of this, the, the um, increased profitability and everything came as a result of making a decision about my values. And when I applied them and I was genuine about them, it, it, turned, it turned into something that was much more profitable and a better place to work. So I will always encourage people that are motivated to do something different, to take that action. And that's encourage your staff and always review. So I think that's everything. And there we go. I hope there's time for questions. I tend to babble along. <laughs> anyway, so I'll leave that. That's I'll leave not that a problem, question. <laughs> That's not a problem. We definitely have time for questions. It's uh, Liz again here. Can everyone hear me on the line? Damon, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Nope. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to repeat of the front end there. So thank you so much uh, to Lori and Damon uh, uh, for you guys speaking about the transformational aspects of a secure workforce. Um, how we can increase employee engagement and satisfaction, and how it can be a competitive strategy to offer a more stable working conditions. And Damon for uh, sharing such um, a passionate example of how you can successfully address your business model, um, including aspects related to precarious employment, such as increasing wages, introducing benefits, how you were able to find efficiencies, and and really, you know, what I heard at the end of the day was create a space that you wanted to go to every day and you were proud of and your employees were proud of, and that resulted in benefits for, for everyone. So thank you very much for talking to how you actually um, moved through that emotionally, strategically, um, and the outcomes that you achieved, and uh, we really appreciate that. So on that note, um, if there are folks, uh, on the line who have some questions for uh, Lori or Damon, please do share in the bottom left-hand screen here in the chat pod. Um, and if you want to speak, you can press star six to unmute yourself. I don't see any questions, Sarah, at this time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, so if anyone does want to just hop off of mute and press star six, you can uh, speak. And if not, you can type into the chat pod. In the meantime, Lori or Demon, oh, we're off to the races. Okay. <laughs> I was going to see if you had anything else to add, but we're going to go. Um, so for Demon, has implementing these changes had any effect on recruitment? Yes. So where, where the recruitment component of it came comes from is, is that I have a higher quality of in potential employees putting in their applications. So prior to 2008, I would receive applications, um, just like just hundreds of them with people looking for work, but didn't have um, lots of skill sets. And, and I would say that's because they were a lot of the jobs that I had offered um, were what I call like what I would consider minimum wage jobs. And of course, prior to 2008, minimum wage was not even the $14 that we have now. I mean, we're talking much less. And, and uh, um, because I think in 2010, it was somewhere in the range of like 
10 to 10 to 11 dollars maximum um and so even somebody can correct me on that because i'm doing that by memory um but uh you know in, in, prior to 2008 it was less than that and so uh so, so so we were getting people that you know in some cases had left school and they would just you know put in applications and so what's very difficult about that is um is is that it's App, resumes can often look really good and then you have to filter through by actually interviewing people and so that's a lot of time consumption there when we when we increased uh, to the living wage base model um, we ultimately set a standard for ourselves which also requires our management staff to be um, very specific about the individuals they hire which also encourages people that are applying um, to make sure that they are coming with the skill sets required in order to to help our uh, business successfully uh, moving forward. So, so yes, it has um, it significantly um, improved our recruitment because uh, it, it's, it's giving us a better uh, quality of um, uh, recruitment opportunities uh, from individuals putting in their applications. Sorry that was so long-winded, but... That's okay. That's great. Um, so uh, someone offered here more of a comment, but it seems that the effects of implementing these changes go well beyond dollar signs. So it would be great to hear more stories of success like Damon's in the future. And I agree. And the more, <laughs> the more business owners that can apply themselves in this manner and share those stories uh, definitely are an asset to our economy at large. And that that kind of speaks to the Better Way Alliance, um, of which I'm one of uh, five companies that, that were sort of the initial founding companies. Um, we now have, we represent over 30,000, 37,000 employees. So uh, we have employers from across um, the country that, um, that help, uh, help us uh, promote uh, good business, decent work models, um, in various manners because they're in various industries, um, but they basically share the, the commonality is, is that we respect our employees and in return our employees respect our businesses. That reciprocity. So Damon, someone has another question for you. When you talk to other employers about better business outcomes, what are some of the challenges you face and how do you overcome them? So I'm assuming you, you might hear some objections or things from other folks when you share about your outcomes. So, so the biggest challenge is um, for, for myself when I'm speaking with other business owners um, that, are, that are facing challenges similar to the ones I faced before the recession and then through the recession it, it hit us hardest. Um, they haven't got to a point where they want to make the changes. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest challenge that I face is, is that they haven't come to the acceptance that there isn't anything wrong within their business, yet the whole conversation is negative. Everything about their business is negative. Um, they work too many hours. The employees don't do enough. Nobody pulls their weight. Uh, people don't show up. The employee turnover is too high. Um, they put their blood, sweat, and tears in. Nobody respects them. Um, all of these things are things that I hear um, sometimes that are challenging for me because it requires me to actually say, okay, back up. Let's talk about some of these challenges that you're experiencing, and let's see how maybe you can move towards uh, dealing with them one by one. And I did my changes over a two-year period, so it wasn't that I had change on a dime. I, I had to make changes over a two-year period in order for it to really um, take hold as a policy within our business. Um, so, so, you know, again, I don't, I don't encourage anyone to make fast changes, but I do encourage them to acknowledge when changes are required. Excellent. Thank you. Change is definitely a, a journey. And um, we hear consistently across, you know, a multitude of projects in that context how, you know, moving and stepping in line with 
the whole team and uh, making changes incrementally can certainly um, create the space for folks to adjust and create the conditions for sustainability. Again, I agree. Any, any other questions on the, the line? We've got some links here. Um, so to visit uh, about the uh, Pepin project, there's a website, so pepinniagara.ca. And then, of course, um, Niagara Knowledge Exchange to, uh, we're going to share the recording for the webinar today, as well as the slides. And any other supplementary resources that were highlighted today um, and links to those resources as well. So before we depart, um, I just wanted to allow another couple minutes here in case folks came up with some questions. And then in the meantime, um, Lawyer Damon, if you had any parting words. Well, I can, it's Lori here. Um, I just, yeah, I'm just really um, always get um, a lot out of listening to Damon and um, uh, I've gotten to, to know him and work with him over the last few years on uh, some of the living wage work here locally. Um, and what he's saying is, is really what, what we're hearing through um, the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network, which does the, um, the local calculations of uh, cost of living and living wage. And, and we have now over uh, 20 employers who have, have signed on and become certified. And um, I'm just I'm hearing a lot of the same um, some of the, a lot of the same um, reasons um, that they're putting forward. I mean, there's there's the values component of of wanting to um, ensure that um, people are are being paid a fair wage, but then you know there is the there is the business component as well. It is about being able to recruit and retain quality employees, and um, and I, I'm just hearing a lot of the a lot of the same. Um, there's a lot of the same themes coming up, and, and I just really, truly hope that, that um, we will continue to see um, more and more businesses here in Niagara um, starting to make that, that, that shift, that mindset. Many of them already have. We just don't even know about them yet. So um, the living wage certification has been a great way for us to start to hear more from, from some of these businesses. But um, I just think that uh, it's... It, it's um, it's a, it's the right direction to be taking at this point. So, so if it's okay if I if I also add some uh, mm -hmm. and I thank Lori, I, I thank Lori, and I've worked and I have had the opportunity to work with Lori, and and I I appreciate um, that uh, working relationship that uh, you know will be go ongoing as we move move forward and and uh, and for the time that we've had. On different projects uh, 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 to date, so I I do appreciate that also, Lori. And um, uh, what I wanted to uh, you know maybe leave uh, some some thought on is is that it's important for entrepreneurs to understand that their business is their business, and um, they don't have to model it on you know a Forbes magazine kind of uh, you know we, this is this is success. And this is this is mediocre success, and this is this, and this is that, um, as you might read in in magazines. I think what entrepreneurs have to realize is is that they have the ability to set their own destinies, and obviously within the legislative model, but they have the ability to set their own destiny as far as the business and what they consider to be success. And I consider success a balance of you know profitability a good work environment, and, and having time. I have six children, and so as a business owner, I, I no longer can work in a business model that requires the business owner to stay for 20 hours a day and go and sleep for four hours. Um, I have to have a business model that works for me and, um, and my family. And, and so to expect any less of my employees that they don't need the same kind of live environment uh, or the working environment and a, and a livability um, would be unfair. And so there's a balance about how we, uh, you know, how our businesses impact our communities and, and how, we, how our employees interact within those communities. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't say that everything is about, um, you know, just being good you know, overall, but I think we're all better off 
when we live and work in an economy that's fair for um, everyone involved. And so as an entrepreneur, I think we, or as entrepreneurs, we have the ability to define that outcome and we don't have to base it on, on things that are sometimes out of reach uh, because we're always striving for something then instead of actually living within our, 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 our abilities and, and local communities. You enjoy what's around you. Excellent. So on that note, uh, it's Liz here again. And on behalf of Niagara Connects, um, I thank you so much uh, for Laurie and Damon coming together. There's something very tangible about bringing together um, data research and the project side together with um, the lived experience and seeing, you know, these programs and the certification and living wage based model lived in practice um, and something really resonant about how, you know, better businesses can create stronger communities and seeing that through. So we thank you guys very much for your dedication, for your trial and error, for pursuing what we know is um, good, good for the greater good. So thank you for your time. Um, we've got some thank yous showing up here in the Q&A, so we appreciate that. And as a friendly reminder, folks, we've recorded the webinar, so, um, and we've got the slides. We'll be circulating all of that. It's going to be up on the Niagara Knowledge Exchange, as well as the resources we mentioned. When we close out the screen here, you're going to be redirected to a very quick survey. If you can let us know how we did, that would be very much appreciated, and we thank you for your time, and please do share with colleagues, as we do think this is important um, information and um, to help our community grow stronger. Thank you. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Get some vitamin D. Be present. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.